This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 15 of season 3 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading The Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, April 9th, 1910. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1910. The uh, first section in this issue is the Westford Center section. The announcement has been received by the Westford relatives of a birth of a little son to Reverend Mr. and Mrs. William Anderson at their home in Covington, Virginia. Miss Grace Lumbert of this village is with Mrs. Anderson and reports mother and son as as doing nicely. The little fellow has been named Charles William Anderson, family names from both sides of the house. Um, I might add that Reverend William Anderson, William Everett Anderson served the Methodist Church in Graniteville from 1905 to 1907, and then again from 1919 to uh, 1924. And he was well known and liked in town. He, he's the only Methodist mer- minister, I believe, who married a Westford girl, Clara Bell Wright. And they spent the last of the, their years in, in Pepperell, and I believe are buried in... Uh, Fairview Cemetery. Reverend Mr. Wallace was present at the session of the Middlesex Northwest Temperance Union at Groton Thursday, sustaining a part in the afternoon's exercise. Cyrus Hosmer of Wakefield has been visiting this past week his daughter, Mrs. W. M. Wright, and his granddaughter, Mrs. W. J. Merritt. Miss Jones, a former parishioner and family friend from Lunenburg, has been a recent guest of Mr. and Mrs. Wallace at the Parsonage. The new Soldiers' Monument has arrived, and workmen have been busy putting it in place this week. This was the Civil War Soldiers' Monument at the intersection of Boston Road and Hildreth Street. And uh, this is all in preparation to the dedication of the monument on Memorial Day in May. Tree Warden Harry L. Nesmith and his men have been doing the annual trimming of shade trees on the common and about the village, and a good amount of work has been necessary, particularly among some of the patriarchal elms, which sadly are all gone. The Edward M. Abbott Hose Company held its regular meeting at its headquarters on Boston Road Tuesday evening. An excellent clam chowder supper with all the accompaniments was served. Owing to John Good's permanent removal from town, Harwood L. Wright was appointed as regular man in his place, and Everett Miller was, was proposed as call man. The supper committee for the evening were Frank E. Miller, Harwood Wright, and Leonard W. Wheeler. Mrs. Amanda T. Fisher quietly and pleasantly observed her 76th birthday Monday of this week. The quartet of Tower Sisters were all able to get together during the day. Mrs. John Burbeck, Mrs. Noah Prescott, Mrs. Samuel A. Hamlin, and Mrs. Alvin Fisher. These and other loving relatives made the day a happy and pleasant one. Mrs. Fisher was the recipient of numerous pretty gifts. Mr. and Mrs. Albert A. Hildreth welcomed another little daughter into their home on Monday of this of this week. This was Helen D. Hildreth, born on April 5th, 1910. Mrs. Edward Fisher entertained the Thimble, Thimble Club at luncheon at her home Tuesday. The June-like day, the pretty decorations, the dainty menu, the model daughters of the home, and the merry sociability with needlework during the afternoon were all factors contributing toward making it one, one of the fairest of pictures to hang away on the walls of Memories Gallery. All the members were present. A telephone has been installed in the town hall. The number is 10-2. The next section is entitled Social. The regular monthly social, which took place at the Congregational Vestry last Thursday evening, was very much of a success. The supper, which was served 
from half past six to eight was well was well patronized fully 100 people being served it was abundant and of good variety the tables were brightened with flowering plants and runners through the center of the tables a vivid spring-like green pussy willows with daffodils downstairs suggested further that spring is here at eight o'clock, a program of readings and music was given that was especially varied and creditable individually. There were, no, there were piano solos by Sadie McMaster and Hazel Hartford, readings by Miss Martha Taylor and Mrs. Gould, and vocal solos by Edson G. Boynton, Cyril A. Blaney, M.D., and John S. Grieg. After this was an elephant party, which consisted of a lot of articles sold at auction. Samuel L. Taylor served as auctioneer, and his stand was appropriately decorated with a large, well-drawn elephant. This caused much merriment, and many white elephants were exchanged. The capable committee in charge of the evening were Madams E.G. Boynton, S.L. Taylor, J.E. Knight, J.L. McMaster, and Florence Isles. A good sum was turned into, into the amount which goes for improvements and repairs. The next uh, couple paragraphs are about the arrivals from Florida. Genial Fred A. Smith returned home Saturday of last week after his winter sojourn in the warmer climate of Florida and brings with him the wider outlook and enthusiasm that seeing other places and people brings to the average person. He combed he combined business and pleasure as much as possible and has much to report to the home friends whom he is glad to be with again. He was gone three months and five days and during that time was in 11 cities, seven towns and six counties. While in Florida, his journeyings took him the length of the St. John's and Oklawalia rivers, temperatures varying from 34 to 100 degrees. On the homeward trip, three days each were spent in Washington and New York. Mr. and Mrs. Pearl Harmon arrived home um, Saturday, the day previous, and Mr. and Mrs. A.F. Foss expect to be here by another week, all wintering in Florida. Next comes the About Town section. Fire started in the woodlot of Amos B. Poli, a little north of the Stony Brook Railroad, Friday afternoon last week. It was first discovered by Samuel H. Balch on the mail route, who immediately notified the owner. Neighbors and fire ex extinguishers soon brought it to terms of control. Charged the cause up to smoking, which set the woods to smoking. The Westford Athletic Association and others danced and ate ice cream Friday evening of last week. A low military orchestra furnished the music for the dancing, and Albert Reeves of Graniteville furnished the food supply. John W. O'Brien has been appointed census enumerator for Westford. He has had previous experience, which was an endorsement in favor of a reappointment. I guess they're they're talking about the 1910 census here, so he must have done the 1900 census. About 75,000 logs of lumber are being teamed by William E. Wright from the Stephen Hutchins farm to the Proctor Sawmill at North Chelmsford. At a meeting of the school committee Tuesday evening, Charles O. Prescott was elected chairman and Walter C. Wright secretary. Miss Arabelle Walker has been entertaining her niece, Mrs. Herbert Coffin, and her two daughters, Elsie and Minnie, from Berwick, Maine. John H. Decatur has been ill for many years, who has been ill for many years, is gradually failing, being confined to his bed most of the time. Dr. Wells is keeping life comfortable, but is unable to affect nature's decree, which has been issued 75 years ago. The nature infirmities of age and paralysis are a strong combination for medical still to overcome. Mrs. Coolidge of Groton was buried in the Fairview Cemetery this week. She was the sister of Luther Blodgett and an aunt of Samuel Blodgett. Her husband was a son of Oren William Coolidge of this town.
at a meeting of the Westford Athletic Association on Monday evening to arrange for the season, Edward Fisher was elected president, Charles M. Troll, vice president, William R. Taylor, secretary, J. Herbert Fletcher, treasurer, Oscar R. Spaulding, Edwin Hamlin, Walter J. Merritt, Alfred W. Hartford, and Harwood L. Wright, executive committee. The association has a confident outlook for the future. The regular monthly meeting of the WCTU was held at the home of Mrs. Quincy Day on Wednesday afternoon. Fourteen were present. Letters were read from the Francis Willard Settlement Home. The president of the union, Mrs. Frank Hildreth, gave a report of the meeting of presidents and executive committees at Newton last week. There was a discussion about the value of suggesting a penny saving system in our schools. It is in force in the Lowell schools, and Superintendent Weber favored it here. Mrs. Hildreth, in behalf of the union president, Mrs. Day, with a, I'm sorry, Mrs. Hildreth, in behalf of the union, presented Mrs. Day with a fine leather-bound Bible since it was her birthday. Mrs. Day was much pleased with the gift and thanked the union. Refreshments were served by Mrs. Day. Mrs. Day was born Ada A. Sharp on April 6, 1864 in New Brunswick, Canada, and married Quincy Day, obviously. Entertainment is the next, next uh, section. The Fortnite Club, which includes everything in town, still continues to furnish entertainment, wholesome and strong, plain, light, laughable. They are to be cheered for their record of service. Last week, Friday evening, was one of their dare and do programs. This, this club actually was made up mostly of um, members from the northerly part of the town, and it uh, met at the old uh, Wright Lion Schoolhouse on Groton Road. Uh, the program consisted of violin solo, Arthur Blodgett, reading, Mrs. Alice Lambert, song, Edward Gamblin, phonograph selections, Mr. Ward, reading, Mrs. Edwin Gould, song, Horace Gould, song, Mrs. Florence Flavall, reading, Mrs. Elizabeth Wyman, song, Mrs. Emily Blodgett, recitation, Edwin Gould, dialogue, falsehood, is the title of the dialogue, the cast of characters was Mr. Hastings, a surly old bachelor, Edwin Gould, Julia Ford, his niece and ward, Miss Stella Glynn, Harry Loring, a young artist, Fred Blodgett, Jenny Loring, his sister, Miss Lillian Wright, Mr. Pettigood, a clergyman, Charles Blodgett, John, a manservant, Edward Gamblin, and Maggie, a maidservant, Mrs. Edwin Gould. Next is the Forge Village section. Mr. and Mrs. James Wiggum are the happy parents of a little daughter, Doris Ada Wiggum, born Thursday, March 31st. Harold Connell, youngest son of Mr. and Mrs. John Connell of Beaverbrook Road, had his leg badly lacerated by being kicked by a horse Wednesday. He will be unable to walk for some time. Mrs. John McNiff met with a painful, if not serious, accident Thursday of last week while washing. A needle that was hidden in the clothes became embedded in her hand. The needle broke in several pieces, causing much pain. Dr. Blaney was called and extracted the pieces. It sounds painful. The Bunting's second football team of Lowell played a pick team from this village Saturday afternoon on Cameron Grove. The game resulted in a tie score being 2-2. Two to two. The ladies' sewing circle enjoyed one of the prettiest and daintiest lunches that has been served last Thursday. This week, the circle will meet with Mrs. F.A. Sweat. Alvin S. Bennett has returned from Washington, D.C., where he went the first of the week to attend the funeral of his brother's wife, Mrs. Angelique Bennett, wife of Dr. Harrison M. Bennett, who died Friday, April 1st. Miss Emily Collins and Miss Sarah Precious entertained the members of their Sunday school classes Saturday evening in Recreation Hall. The long table was arranged to accommodate all of the children and was daintily appointed. 
A delicious supper was served at six o'clock. The remainder of the evening was spent in music and games. Each child received a pretty souvenir of the occasion. Miss Alice L. Prescott is home from her school in Andover for the usual spring vacation. Uh, the next uh, section is entitled Death. John B. Splane, son of Mrs. Elizabeth and the late Patrick Splane, died early Friday morning, April 1st, at his home on Union Street, uh, which is now East Prescott Street, after a long illness, aged 33 years. The deceased was postmaster for a number of years, succeeding his brother, the late Daniel Splane, who had charge of the post office for 12 years. John B. Splane was born in this village, and with the exception of a few years in which his family lived in Peabody, he has lived here all his life. He was widely known and highly respected by all who knew him. Of a quiet disposition, he cared not for the pleasures of social or the honors of public life, but gave freely, freely of his time and services, and always held out a helping hand to his neighbors and friends who were in trouble. No one ever appealed to him in vain. He was proprietor of the J.B. Splane General Store, and his business brought him in contact with many people, particularly the summer residents who always found him ready to render assistance or information. His genial personality won for him many friends who will learn of his death with keen regret. He leaves beside his mother, Mrs. Elizabeth Splane, three sisters, Mrs. Elmer E. Nutting and Miss Abby Splane of this village, and Mrs. Frank Rose of Belmont, also three nieces and one nephew. The deceased was a member of Court F of A, that's Friends of Foresters of America. Funeral services were held Sunday afternoon at St. Catherine's Church, Reverend Edmund T. Schofield officiating. A very large number of friends and neighbors had gathered to pay their last respects. The casket was hidden amid a wealth of beautiful flowers, the sad offerings of loving friends and neighbors. A large delegation of court air, Foresters of America, attended the services. The floral tributes were unusually beautiful and numerous. Burial was in the family lot in St. Catherine's Cemetery, Graniteville. Tuesday morning, a requiem high mass was celebrated at St. Catherine's Church at 8, at 8 o'clock. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending April 9th, 1910. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Westford Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you'll join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.